Okay, can you hear me? Can people hear me? Oh. I think so. Uh, well, hi everyone. Welcome to the live. Um, today, we're going to be doing a little something here. We're going to be reading about uh, some... Here, these are known as Tales of South Asia, Legendary Creatures. These are from... I think this is from Highlights, I want to say. So, we're going to read about the five... Nope. We're going to read about these one-legged monsters, and also something known as the Lamia. So, uh, if you guys want to be clued into more lives, make sure you're subscribed and click the bell for notifications. And there will be more. And we're going to do a special thing on on Halloween, which is coming up on Tuesday. I can't believe it. So I hope you guys tune in for that. And now, without further ado, here we go. <clears throat> One day, Sumai, a young Santal boy, was out hunting carrying arrows for shooting small birds, rabbits, and deer. He crept through the jungle, his ears pricking, picking up every sound. A slight rustle on his left told him that a dove was hidden amongst the branches, a low murmur that monkeys were watching him. The jungle cocks challenged him from the heavy cover by the river. Kuk-kuk-kuk! But they were too way. He heard a faint sound coming from far away. Swish, swoosh, swish. He stood still and listened. Something heavy is coming up the hill, he thought. And he crouched silently behind the rocks, just the top of his head and his eyes showing. He knew that there are two rules if you want to hide from an animal in the jungle. The first is to keep absolutely still. Even an animal sees you, it won't be able to make you out if you don't move, his father had told him. The second rule is to make sure that the wind is not blowing directly from you to the beast you are hunting, or it will carry your smell. So Samai picked his spot and waited, motionless. Crunch! Crunch! The head and shoulders of an enormous stag appeared. His giant antlers spread out. He was dark brown in color, with a shaggy mane around his neck and long, coarse hair on his sides. What a magnificent creature! It's the biggest I've ever seen. I won't shoot. I can't hurt such a beautiful beast. I'll just watch him. <coughs> the lookout amongst a band of gray monkeys saw the boy and gave a guttural scream, and then... The biggest monkey in the band joined in, passing on the alarm. The stag realized he was being watched, and galloped away in frightened, bellowing ork, ork, again and again as he crashed down the hillside. Samai jumped up from his hiding place and followed the stag. Now Samai had been warned not to go too deep into the jungle, where tigers, leopards, and bears roamed freely there. But... In his excitement, he forgot the warnings. Running as fast as he could, he kept the stag in sight until he came to a dank and evil-smelling grove where the trees and creepers grew so closely together that there was hardly any light. A low, snarling sound filled the air. Rawr! 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 Car! Car! The ground shook with a heavy thumping. Clump, 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 as a dark shape loomed before him, breathing heavily, all covered with greeny moss, slime, and creepers. It was a Gormuha. Samai stepped back in horror. It was such a strange creature. It was monstrous, 
It had a head like a horse, and although its body and arms were shaped like those of a man, it was twice they were twice the size. This is uh what they look like. What can I do? thought Sumai, as he stood rooted to the spot, too frightened to move. Clumph, clumph, clumph. The creature moved closer, bringing with him a smell of rotting eggs. And as he approached, Sumai discovered that there was only one leg clomping towards him. And that leg ended in a flat, spade-like foot with three big toes curling upwards, covered with tufts of greenish-brown hair. Sumai shut his eyes tight and screamed. Suddenly, he felt himself flying through the air as the Gormuha picked him up as easily as if he were a floppy rabbit <laughs> and swung him over his shoulder. A stench of fermenting seaweed filled Samai's nostrils as he hung there, limp and helpless, his face buried in the Gormuha's knotted, stinking horse hair. Ooh, guess he never heard of herbal essences. <laughs> he bounced and bumped as the Gormuha moved through the jungle and was finally flung to the ground in a huge, dark cave. The vast space echoed with a clump, clump, clump of a hundreds of one-legged gormuhas, their eyes glowing like live, live coals in the dark. The smell was horrible. As this was where the gormuhas did their cooking, and the smoke choked Samai. Samai crawled into a corner and covered his face with his hands, for now he realized that the gormuhas ate up everything they caught. The cave resounded with groans and grunts and with the crunching of bones and the smacking of lips. Samai was terrified. But it seemed as if the Gormuhas were in no hurry to eat him. Every day they fed him with spicy rice and delicious chunks of wild yams and spinach, and every day they pummeled his arms and legs to see how fat and tender he had become. Then they would gather around him filling the caves with their delighted grunts of approval. Now, although the Gormuhas had only one leg, they could hop very fast, and they made their victims race with them every day. It was understood that as soon as one of their prisoners had grown strong enough to beat them in two races, he would be eaten. There were two tests that helped them to decide if their victims were ready. The first was a race on the roads. Sharp-eyed Gormuhas were posted as watchdogs all along the route. The second test was a race across a special field. The Gormuhas had built a high wall around this field. A sentry box on a platform had been built at one end of it where the Gormuhas on duty stood guard. They had a good view of the surrounding countryside for all around were flat rice fields and a few clump of trees. So Mai spent much of his time thinking of ways to escape. His only chance seemed to be of running away. So he would have to train until he could run faster than his captors. But without letting them know. While the Gorumuhas were relaxing one day, Samai so tested the strength of the high wall in the special field where the second test was usually held. He was overjoyed when he came by a crumbling section. The rains must have weakened this part, said Samai softly to himself. But the Gurumuhas have not noticed. As yet. He made a careful note of that area. And at night, whenever the Gurumuhas were not so watchful, he crept out and tried to weaken it further by loosening the stones around it. Day after day, Samai raced with the Gormuhas on the roads. He knew he could win, but he deliberately slowed down and let the Gormuhas beat him. He could tell that the Gormuhas were growing restless. They could not understand why, although he grew strong, Samai never beat them. Samai beat their suspicions, sensed their suspicions, and made, his, made up his mind to escape the next day. The Gormuhas had also come to a decision. They would race him the following day in the special field, second test, and then they would eat him up whether he won or not, for they were tired of waiting. The next day, when the race began, Samai dashed across the special field. 
He had carefully planned the route he would follow. Follow, and he headed toward that section where the wall had been crumbling. He could hear the Gormuhas thumping close behind him. As he drew nearer to the weak part of the wall, wall, he did not stop, but ran straight into it. Large stones, pebbles, and clumps of mud came flying, and the dust rose up in a cloud as Samai burst through the crumbling wall. Clump, clump. The Gormuhas were all raced after Samai. They were so surprised to see him run straight through the solid stone wall that they all tried to get through the hall at once. Clunk, clunk, crash! Some of them collided, some of them toppled, and all of them crashed into a heap. <laughs> but soon they recovered their senses, picked themselves up, and were after Samai. Still, more and more stones and pebbles and mud were flung high as the Gormuhas clumsily tried to force their way through the gap Samai had made. But where was Samai by this time? He was racing through the rice fields, and he did not stop, even for a moment, for he knew how fast the Gormuhas could hop. And he was not wrong, for soon he heard, Clunf, 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 grunts and snarls. As the Gormuhas thumped close behind him, he glanced over his shoulder. They were not very far away, he groaned. Who can help me now? Just then, something shot out from a clump of trees ahead of him. Ronk, donk, ronk, donk. A pair of giant antlers swept past him as the enormous stag, bellowing all the way, charged into the straight into the gumars behind them. One by one, he charged them. Oof, oof. The Gormuhas panted, panted, as completely winded, they lost their balance and crashed to the ground. They fell over each other in a heap and lay there struggling and snarling. By the time they had pulled themselves out of their mess, Somai was out of sight. Once outside their special territory, the Gormuhas had no power over Sumai, over anyone. Sumai was, by now, far beyond the land of the Gormuhas. So they all stomped home gnashing their teeth and growling with hunger and disappointment. When Samai arrived home, his family were overjoyed, for they thought he must have been killed by the wild animals in the jungle. As no one had ever escaped from the Gormuhas, no one knew where their territory began and ended. Samai told them everything, what Gormuhas were like, how they lived, and particularly the area of their territory. Samai was treated as a hero, and from that day the story of the Gormuhas has spread. Now all Santals know where the Gormuhas live, and they tell their children to keep away. The end. Well, I have to admit, that's a really good story there, and um, I think it's really neat that the stag that he saw earlier came back and saved him. Now, um, if you hold on for just one second, I'm going to turn the camera the other way really fast. Here we go. Sorry, you guys stare at my, my thing I have there. And I'm just going to give myself a little something, wet my whistle, as it were. And then we're going to read another story, and then we're going to call it a night. there, huh? Mm. All right. And now we're going to read about the Lamia. Now, this should be interesting. Mm. Because we all know Lamia as uh, 
or being very nasty. So, we're going to see how this Lamy is described. It comes to us from Pakistan. And if you've read uh, Harry Potter or seen the movies or both, there's one special element to this end of the story. But let's get to it. <clears throat> Long ago, there lived a handsome young governor named Ali Mardan. He looked after the people of the beautiful valley of Kashmir. One day, while he was out hunting in the forest close to the Dal Lake, he saw a stag. He gave chase, but the stag moved like the wind. Ali Mardan was an excellent huntsman, and he followed and he followed the stag for many hours. His horse was very tired. He himself was exhausted, and yet the stag seemed as fresh as when the chase began. Ali Mardan was puzzled. Suddenly the stag disappeared into the bushes. Ali Mardan pulled gently at his reins to stop the horse and waited for the stag to come out of its hiding place. He waited and waited. No stag appeared. Where was it? Tying his horse to the tree, he searched among the bushes. There was no stag there. How mysterious, he said aloud. Could my eyes have deceived me? And he turned away, tired and disappointed. About to ride home, he heard a noise. Holding his horse still, he listened. There, then, following the sound, he was astonished to find a lovely woman, a stranger, sitting under a tree. Uh-oh. She was luxuriously dressed in silken garments, her brocade robe flowing down to her feet. Her jewels sparkled as she sobbed like a child. Ali Mardan, trying not to frighten her, asked softly, How can I help you, dear lady? Still sobbing, the lady replied, You are very kind, sir. <clears throat> My father was a Chinese king who was killed in battle. Most of our noblemen were captured, but I escaped. I have been wandering from place to place. I have no family and no home, home now. What is to become of me, kind sir? Ali Mardan smiled. Don't be afraid, dear princess. I am the governor of this country. I will protect you. Enchanted by her beauty and her gentleness, he took the Chinese princess to his palace in the Shalimar Gardens. Not long afterwards, he asked her to marry him. The wedding feast went on for days and days. Famous musicians, singers, and dancers were invited to the Great Hall to entertain the wedding guests. Acrobats, magicians, and storytellers amused the crowd in the decorated courtyards. The sad Chinese princess had found happiness at last. She carried out her duties cheerfully and was admired and praised for her goodness. The governor was so proud to have a wife so devoted to him and loved by all his people. One day, much to his surprise, his wife said, I have never asked you for anything before, dear husband, but there is something I would like for you to do for me now. <clears throat> Please build a palace for me besides the Dal Lake, a palace with a balcony. Then, whenever I wish, I could stand out there and see my reflection in the water. Hmm, interesting. Ali Mardan was glad to be able to do something to please his beloved wife. Laborers worked hard day and night to complete the exquisite palace of white marble inlaid with beautiful mosaics of precious stones. It was surrounded by gardens full of rare flowers and fruit trees. Ali Mardan and the Chinese princess moved in and lived happily in the lake palace. With each passing day, the prince, their love for each other grew stronger. In spite of this happiness, however, Ali Mardan could not rest at night. 
His face grew pale and gaunt. There was a strange, haunted look in his eyes. One morning, he woke up with a terrible pain in his stomach. The royal doctor tried to help him, but it, all his medicines failed to cure Ali Mardan. He could not leave his sick bed. His wife spent most of her time at his bedside, taking great care of him. Everyone was worried about the governor's mysterious illness. Now, it just so happened that a guru, or holy man, was passing along the shores of the Dal Lake, carrying a small jar of water. He had followed this road many times before and was astonished to see the palace. Who could have built such a wonderful palace here so quickly? I will go and find out. He wandered through the gardens, admiring the beauty of the lotus and the bright hibiscus, enjoying the fragrances of pale yellow jasmine and the frangipani. Dewdrop diamonds glistened in the sweet grass beside the shimmering fountains. He listened to the sweet songs of the bulbul and watched the tiny hummingbirds darting into the flowers of honey. And then, tired and drowsy, he lay down to rest under a fig, sleep, fig tree, and there he fell asleep. Quite by chance, Ali Mardan, feeling much better, was strolling in his garden. His servants were helping him along. Seeing the servant, seeing the stranger lying under this tree, he said softly, You must welcome all travelers here. Do not disturb this holy man. Bring the best bed you can find and place him gently on it, and take great care of his precious jaw. When the guru awoke, he, he was surprised to find himself resting on a comfortable bed under the fig tree. Who lives here? he asked the gardener. This is the palace of Ali Mardan, the governor of the Valley of Kashmir, he was told, and he would like to speak to you. The guru picked up his jar of water and followed the gardener. <clears throat> He found the governor in his room, reclining on his bed, and wondered why he looked so gaunt and stony-eyed. He was invited to sit next to a carved ivory table, set with a, tray, with a silver tray of delicate sweetmeats and fruits and goblets of cool sherbet. Travelers are welcome here. Are welcome here. Please accept these offerings, Guru. May I ask what brought you here? The guru took a pomegranate from the tray. Thank you for your kind welcome, governor. I come here as often as I like to drink the water from a straight secret spring not far away. How amazed I was to see your magnificent palace. I passed this way not long ago and there was no palace here. Ali Mardan was about to speak when he gripped his side suddenly and groaned. The guru was told about the governor's illness. Can I help you, governor? He asked. Ali Mardan bowed his head. If you can cure me of this terrible sickness, I shall be grateful, guru. The guru examined him carefully. He was silent for some time. At last, he spoke. Governor... Have you a stranger living in your palace? A woman? A stranger? A woman? Replied Ali Mardan, looking perplexed. Oh, what am I reading? Um, I'm reading a book from this called uh, Tales of Southeast Asia. We just read one about the, uh, about the, Guru, Guru Maha, which was a is a one arm one legged uh, monster that looks like this. But right now we're reading about the Lamia. Let me see where was I. A stranger, a woman, replied Ali Mardan, looking perplexed. I have married a beautiful stranger. It is true, but how did you know? The guru nodded without saying a word. I was out hunting a stag when I saw her. It was a mysterious meeting. This marble palace was built specially for her, with a balcony overlooking the lake. 
she wanted to see her reflection in the water. The guru shook his head slowly. Governor, he said in a grave voice, you are in great danger. Hmm. Ali Mardan looked worried. I can help you, but only if you do exactly as I tell you, said the guru. The governor put his hand on the guru's arm. What do you want me to do? I will follow your instructions, I promise. Please help me, guru. You must order two kinds of ki tree spicy rice to be cooked this evening. One sweet and one salty. The ki, the ki tree must be served on one dish. The sweet rice on one side and the salty on the other. When the Chinese princess sat down, as usual, to share her meal with her husband, he turned the salty side of the dish toward her. Her husband seemed to be enjoying his meal, so although she was puzzled, she did not complain about the saltiness of the food, but ate in silence. The guru had given special instructions to the servants. No drinking water was to be left in the governor's bedroom. When the governor and his wife were in their bedroom, their door was to be locked on the outside. The servants carried out the guru's orders. In the middle of the night, the Chinese princess woke up. The saltiness of her food had made her feel very thirsty. She looked around for her goblet of cool water, but she found none. She rose to call her maid. The door was locked from the outside. She couldn't get she couldn't get out. She put her hand to her throat as she began to cough. She grew desperate. I must get out, she gasped. She watched her husband until she was quite asleep. She was quite sure he was fast asleep. And then, taking the shape of a snake, she slid out from the window, through the window, and down the lake to quench her thirst, and it was not long before she returned. Changing into her human form once again, she lay quietly beside her husband. Ali Mardan was horrified. He pretended to be asleep and had seen what happened. He did not get back to sleep that night. I wouldn't either. Early next morning, he told the guru what had taken place. You must help me, guru. The guru bowed his head. Dear governor, it was just what I suspected. Your wife is a Lamia, a snake woman. Ali Mardan was shocked. A Lamia, he cried. And he covered his face with his hands. Now let me tell you all I have learned about the Lamia, said the guru. <clears throat> there are three stages in its life. If no human being has looked on a snake in the first hundred years, a crest forms on, a, on the head of that snake, and it becomes the king of the snakes. If 200 years have passed and no human being has looked on the snake, the snake changes into a dragon. And after 300 years, it becomes a Lamia. A Lamia possesses strange powers. It can change its appearance as it wishes, Usually the form, usually it takes over the body of a young, innocent woman. In this form, it attracts young men and leads them to death and destruction. But I assure you, your wife knows nothing of the cursed part of her existence. Ali Mardan shuddered. I cannot believe she would ever wish to harm me. Oh, my poor Chinese princess, is there no way to help her? What can I do? Yes, there is something you can do, said the guru. But be careful. If the spirit of the Lamia suspects that we know her secret, it will destroy us. If you really want to help your Chinese princess, you must try to free her from her Lamia existence. Alas, there is only one way you can succeed. Through a purification by fire. But in freeing her, you will lose her, for she will perish in the fire. Ali Mardan groaned. 
you must have courage. Build a small house with only one bedroom and a kitchen. In the kitchen, build an oven with a strong, heavy lid, a large oven. Then he bent down and whispered into Ali Mardan's ear. Ali Mardan per turned pale. Oh no, 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 he cried out in great pain. Ali Mardan prayed for guidance. Eventually, he realized he would have to follow the guru's advice. He built a small house and stayed there for 40 days. His wife was the only person to visit him. She was happy to spend her time looking after him. One day, Ali Mardan said, Dear wife, please help me. I need a special kind of bread. Please bake a loaf for me. The Chinese princess turned quite pale. I will do anything for you, dear husband, but I cannot bake. You know how I hate ovens. I have never cooked anything in the oven before. I wonder why. <laughs> but there's no one else here to look after me, said Ali Mardan. The doctor told me to be careful. My life is in danger. If you really love me, dear wife, please bake this loaf for me. The Chinese princess could not refuse to help her sick husband. She prepared the loaf, and when it was time to bake it, she stooped over the mouth of the oven. Oh boy, I think I know what's coming. Ali Mardan was waiting for this moment, praying for courage to help him carry out his painful task. He pushed her in and slammed the strong, heavy lid. It was impossible for her to escape. He rushed out of the house, trembling, his eyes full of tears, following the guru's instructions. He then set fire to his little house, fanned by a strong wind. It was soon ablaze, roaring like an angry dragon. Weary and sad at heart, Ali Madan turned away. The guru gently laid a hand on his shoulder. You have been brave, dear governor. Do not despair. You will find comfort and strength soon. Now go home to the lake palace and rest for two days. Come back to see me on the third day. On the third day, Ali Mardan was completely recovered from his illness. With the guru, he visited the place where the little house where the little house had been it was discovered all that was left was a mound of gray ash sift through the ash and you will find something said the guru Ali Mardan sifted through the ash and found a small pebble found a small pebble Choose, said the guru. Which would you have, the pebble or the ash? The pebble, Ali Mardan said. You had the courage, governor, to destroy the one you loved in order to set her free. It is not easy to carry out such a task, for evil may sometimes creep into our lives disguised as beauty. But love overcomes evil. Your sacrifice will not go unrewarded. The guru gave the pebble to Ali Mardan. Take this pebble and guard it well. It is the real essence of a Chinese princess. Whatever you touch will turn to gold. Touch with it will turn to gold. It is a symbol of her love for you. Then, joining his hands together, the guru bowed. He put some of the ash in the hem of his robe and walked away. He was never seen again. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ali Mardan sat alone beside the Dal Lake. He had loved the Chinese princess, her beauty and her mystery, and now he had lost her. She had left him something very precious, it was true. Whatever you touch with it will turn to gold, he said to himself. 
He thought for a long time. A treasure such as this could be the cause of envy and hatred. There might be those, some who even prepared to fight and kill in order to possess it. Ali Mardan shuddered. What should he do? The spirit of my Chinese princess is free, he said. The Lamia is destroyed. Why should this pebble, the symbol of her love for me, be in more strife into this world? Death and destruction too, perhaps, just like the Lamia did? Oh no, no, no! All night he lay awake, the pebble clutched tight in his hand, thinking of his beloved Chinese princess. In the red rays of the early dawn, Ali Mardan rose and walked down to a fast-flowing river. He threw the pebble into its waters and stood for a while, looking into its death depths. Then he sighed. A great burden had been lifted off his shoulders. At last he felt at peace with the world. He turned his face toward the sun and slowly walked away. People say that the pebble which Ali Mardan threw away was the Philosopher's Stone, which can turn metal into any gold, any metal into gold. Where is it now? Nobody knows. But all throughout history and all over the world, people have searched for it. Someday, somewhere, Perhaps the Philosopher's Stone will be found. Who knows? The end. I have to admit, that's a very sad story and a little, it's a little bittersweet too, but it's interesting to see that this could have been an, a thing of how the Philosopher's Stone was created, but I guess we'll never know. Well, thank you guys for coming to a little bit of a short live, I apologize, but it is um, 1040 at night and I do have stuff I need to do tomorrow, but I am glad that you came by and uh, listened to the stories that I read. If you have any suggestions for any more stories, please let me know on any of my social media. Uh, you can also leave a comment on the live after I post it and, you know, just... Um, Stay tuned and let me know what you guys want to see. So, until next time, I'll see you guys later. Bye.